heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Wonderful words. Lord, do it, we pray this morning. I'm going to share a little bit more of building on what Joe shared earlier about the uh, the building of the wall and this, this story of Ezra. So this is uh, chapter eight of the um, Arise and Build uh, project of Nehemiah. And the subject this morning is the explosive power of the word of God, the explosive power of the word of God. The Bible is a high explosive. There was a prime minister in 1928 who said these words. The prime minister was Stanley Baldwin, and he said the Bible is a high explosive, but it works in strange ways. And no no living man can tell or know how that book in its journey through the world has startled the individual soul in 10,000 different places into a new life, a new world, a new belief, a new conception a new faith. It's a living thing, the Bible. It's a picture here of a gentleman um, who uh, is a pub owner in a place called Hevertree in Devon. You're probably wondering why I've got him involved in this story, but he had an unfortunate incident where he was cleaning the pipes in the pub with two different kinds of cleaners, and uh, as he put them together, there was an explosion and he was airlifted to hospital. Poor chap. The point of that story is that you can have two different uh, fluids that uh, stand alone. They have no power in themselves, but put together, they are explosive. Now, we know that the word of God has incredible potential. By the word of God, this whole world was created. But as far as our lives are concerned, unless our hearts are involved with the word of God, there is no explosion. So the key thing often is not the word of God, but how we apply it, how we respond to it, how our hearts are to do with the word of God. So the word of God plus a responsive heart equals a powerful thing. So we're going to look at their hearts in this story. The first thing you notice in Nehemiah 8 is that they were very hungry, hungry for the word of God. It says, and all the people gathered as one man, this is verse 1, uh, into the square before the water gate, as, as Joe described. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So how do we know the people were hungry? Well, first of all, it says, all the people gathered as one man. Do you know there's incredible power in unity? I often pray that prayer in the epistles that we would be one heart, one soul, one mind, one, uh, uh, one uh, spirit working together for the faith of the gospel. Incredible power in unity. But their unity brought them together and they wanted to hear the law. So it says they told Ezra. It wasn't that Ezra said, let's listen to the Lord. They told him, come on, Ezra, we want to hear the word of God. We want to hear the Bible. And so Ezra described this, uh, this priest comes into the scene. It says of him in chapter to seven and verse six of Ezra, this Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel had given. And the king, that's Artaxerxes, if you remember, granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. There were three waves of exiles that came back to, um, uh, back to Jerusalem. The first one uh, came and they started to, to rebuild the temple. And then Ezra was sent back by Artaxerxes. There was obviously something about Ezra that had captured the heart of Artaxerxes. He actually gave him quite a lot more than he gave Nehemiah for the journey. And he said, go back. And Ezra was thanking God that he could go back to beautify the temple of the Lord. But the word of God was his ministry. The second thing it says after hunger is that they were attentive. It says in, in Nehemiah 8 verse 2, he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. 
as Joe's pointed out, this was a long time. Probably at least three hours he was reading the law. By the law, we mean the Torah, the teaching of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You might think some of those books are not the most exciting ones, but these guys were attentive. He read it from early morning till midday. And then in chapter 8 and verse 3, it says, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law i'm really challenged by this because in this age that we live it's very difficult to be attentive and the particularly the internet age and our phone there's always a message coming a, a reminder a notification other interesting apps there's the news app you know we need to, to keep uh, keep up with what's going on but the Bible demands our attention and these people are hungry and attentive the third thing is they were respectful. They esteemed the word of God highly. It says, as Joe pointed out, Ezra the scribe was lifted up. He stood on a wooden platform that they'd made for the purpose. I believe this shows us that the word of God is higher. I love other books. I love uh, many books. I love, uh, loved as a, a teenager, particularly Tolkien's books and The Lord of the Rings. I read that book three times as a teenager. But I've read the Bible many more times than that because it's a living book. It never gets boring to me. It, it's, it, it's an alive book. It's always fresh, new every day as we learn to read it with God. It's higher. Ezra's platform, the word of God, was higher than personal prophecy. I'm glad of personal prophecy. And when somebody uh, shares something with you that God is showing them, it can be a, a very encouraging and powerful thing. And I wouldn't diminish that at all. But the word of God is different. It is unchangeable. It is unquestionable. It is higher. It's a higher word. And then Jesus himself, he loved the word of God. He was full of the word of God. He knew it by memory. In John 10 and verse 35, he said these incredible words, the scripture cannot be broken. So highly did he esteem it. At the coronation of our queen, these words were read out to her as they presented the Bible to her. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the living or the lively oracles of God. The Bible, the oracles of God, the most precious thing on earth. It's not in heaven, it's here on earth. And there's nothing more precious for our lives than the Bible. And the fourth thing they had was understanding. Because they, uh, Ezra wanted them to understand the word of God. In Nehemiah 9 and verse 7, it says, the Levites help the people to understand the law. So the Bible is understood in community. This is a very strange time at the moment where uh, it could be just me as an individual, God and the Internet. There's an incredible amount of knowledge. There's an, uh, an incredible amount of Bible teaching. There's an incredible amount of error actually, as well, on the internet. It's very important that we read the Bible with the right understanding. And so Ezra made sure that he got the Levites trained in the law to explain maybe the things that weren't so clear. It was teamwork. I remember Bob um, explaining to me one day that he felt that the word of God should be interpreted in community. And that's what, what a wonderful thing about a Bible study. When we get round the word of God, like Ezra, we read it out. And then people bring different parts of understanding. And the picture becomes clear. And we as God's community can understand the word. It was explained by the Levites. And then in uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, this is the exhortation to, uh, to a young leader. Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. 
We need to familiarize ourselves with the Bible. If we want to be useful to God, we need to get to know it. We need to understand it. We need to look at the, the hard bits and the easy bits. We need to see the whole picture so that we don't become a one doctrine person or a one trick pony. So easy to just get occupied with one thing in the Bible. We need a broad spectrum of it. And then maybe most important is that we need to personalize the, the Bible. This was personalized by the congregation. They wanted to hear what the word of God had to say to them. They wanted to see how it applied to their lives. They listened eagerly. And this was the response in verse 9, as Joe told us. All the people wept as they heard the word of the Lord, because there it was, there were things in there that they weren't doing, the Ten Commandments. Maybe there was lying, maybe there was adultery, maybe there, there, there was thieving, all the things and the, the, the word of God exposed in their lives, and they were crying, oh God, you know, uh, what is to become of us? But the Bible is also corrective, and it shows us the way to go, and it leaves us in a place of joy. And in Nehemiah 9, the next chapter, just uh, just uh, there's another day when he's reading out the law to them. And it says, and they stood up. This is Nehemiah 9 uh, and verse 3. They stood up in their place and they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of the day, they made confession and worship the Lord God. And as we read the Bible, it should lead us to confession. We read the law of the Lord is perfect, transforming the soul. Lord, I thank you that your word is perfect. Lord, I want your word to transform my soul. We read things, we apply it to ourselves. We confess our shortfallings, we confess our sins, and we worship the one who has forgiven us our sins. We thank God for the blood of Jesus and for the redemption we have in him. And our hearts are brought into a place of joy. Remember Jeremiah, he said, I found your words and I ate them and they became to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. David said, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation every day. It's sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. It's to bring us joy in the end. So God is looking for responsive hearts. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is alive and active. It's sharp, but let it pierce your hearts. It cuts all the way through to where soul and spirit meet. Sometimes we don't read our Bible long enough for it to pierce us. Take time to read the Bible. God is looking for humble hearts. Isaiah 66 and verse 2 says this, I will look favorably on this kind of person, one who is humble, submissive in spirit, and trembles at my word. Do you tremble at God's word? Do I tremble at God's word? I want to tremble at his word. And then finally, it should be enjoyed. We just uh, read this bit and, ne and Nehemiah and Ezra, they get together. And Nehemiah says it doesn't want them to be in a bad place. So again, this community around the word, he says, look, this isn't to bring you into a place of distress and, and, and disappointment and, and discouragement. You know, this is a special day. The joy of the Lord is your strength, he says. I'd like to um, just finish by looking at Ezra himself. And this is a bit of a, a takeaway. What was Ezra's power? What was Ezra's power? And here it is, Ezra 7 verse 10, as we close, let's think about this verse. Ezra, it says, was determined. Joe says he gave himself to, was devoted to three things to study the Lord's teachings, to live by them, and to teach their rules. What a challenge for any teacher of the Bible in whatever capacity, capacity that is. It's so easy to study it and to teach it, or just to study and to think that when, because we know it, we've applied it to our lives. We must apply this book to our lives. Let's just pray over that verse, shall we? Father, we thank you for Ezra. 
Father, we thank you that he was determined to study the law of the Lord. Father, we pray that you would give us a heart to teach, uh, to study your law, to study your teaching. Father, we pray you would give us a hunger. We pray you would make us attentive to your word. We pray that we would give your word time in our lives. Father, we pray that you would help us to apply these things, that we would live by them, Lord. Father, even this week, I pray this would become relevant and applicable to us. And where possible, Father, where we have opportunity, that we would be able to share these things with others. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for, for listening to that. I do hope that you can apply the Bible to your lives, even